What's up, New York City? I'm home. Chef Henry Dudley, host of the Chef Gang Podcast Show. We're here live in Harlem, Harlem, New York, 116th Street. Go check out my man, Chef Carlos Swepson, his spot, Boulevard Bistro. See, this is a tale about a magical place. That place is Harlem. Whether you call it Uptown, Harlem World, or even Sugar Hill, it's all the same thing. This tale is not only about a magical place, but the magic within the place, the culture, the fashion, the people, the economics, and oh yeah, last but not least, the food. See, Harlem was the epicenter of a renaissance where poor black folks migrated from the south. Some found a better life, some didn't. But either way, everybody enjoyed the magic of Harlem. See, as a Bronx native, I remember growing up and Harlem was a culinary amusement park with the likes of Amy Ruth's, Sylvia's, Jack's Nest, and the world famous Cotton Club. I was a little too young for that, but you get the message. And here we are today, back in New York, not only acknowledging Harlem's culinary giants, but celebrating a new legend. Me and Carlos go way back, okay? A chef who decided not to revolutionize black food, but instead to purify it. I'm gonna get you cooking right now. Okay, so let's start. We're not wild. It's right there, it's right there. See what I mean? Oh, most definitely is right there. Huh? You get as technical as you want to hear, Chef. You get as simple as you want to hear, yeah. Chef. You can smell the seasoning. You can smell the flavors. You know, people love that, man. Just like It's a lot of cooks and a lot of chefs that don't taste their food oh, while they're cooking. You know what I mean? If your mama made you these like this before school, you're just going to fall asleep in class. <laughs> it came together nice. It's still nice and smooth. And you know the carryover cooking? We are here with Chef Carlos Swepson at his 8th Avenue Eatery Boulevard Bistro on this episode of the Chef Gang Podcast. This is Chef Carlos Swepson, and you're watching Chef's Gang Podcast. Yeah, what's up, everybody? Chef Henry Dudley, Chef Game Podcast. We're here in Harlem World, Harlem, USA. With my man, Chef Carlos Swepson, at his establishment, Boulevard Bistro. Yo, man, listen, we go way back. We're going to talk a lot of crazy shit later on. Okay. But at the end of the day, I want to get in here and, and get you cooking. You okay. know what I'm saying? Everybody's talking about how legendary your food is in the Harlem scene. We're going to touch base on that. But I see we're going to do one of your favorite dishes here, right? right talk right. to me about what we're doing today. So right now, today, how are you? So we're gonna be doing the shrimp and grits. Right. So we're gonna start with some nice big jumbo shrimp. And then I have some andouille sausage. And I like heat on heat. Mm -hmm. So I have a little um, jalapeno peppers. I leave a little bit of the seeds in it. Right. That's where the heat is at. I have some soft American cheese that's gonna go inside the grits. I got some hominy grits. I got some cheddar cheese that's gonna go on top. That's gonna create like an au gratin once we throw it inside the salamander. I got a little lemon juice that's gonna go inside, that's gonna go with the shrimp, just to add a little acid bad, to it. Bad, bad. And a little whole butter that's gonna go inside the grits and get finished off the shrimp with, the, with that. And then I use equal parts heavy cream and milk. So let's start. We'll get, so the grits are gonna take a little longer, so we'll start with the grits, all right? So we'll go with the heavy cream, all right? And then we'll go with the whole milk. All right. So you're using two uh, fats in terms of your liquid, right? right? Why are you using both, a heavy cream and a milk? Well, I would really, the, the milk is not heavy, heavy in fat. Mm -hmm. And I use the whole, the, um, the heavy cream that I use, it's not a 40%, it's a 36%. Got it. Which is, it's still fat, but it's, it's, it's not a ultra of pasteurized. So you want to season them towards the end. That's a home trick too. Grits can be seasoned almost towards the end, 
that way you know exactly what they're gonna taste like. Exactly. Right? This is, you know, chefs, we like to control a lot of things, but there's certain things and cooking <laughs> methods that we can't control. That's because so, we're fucking so control this is ready. <laughs> All right? So I'll just go in with that, right? I'll turn this down. All right? Then I'll grab my whisk. All right? You know, for all the young cooks at home, right? And your young cooks just starting out the industry, these knobs here are to adjust the heat, right? <laughs> They're your friend. It's slow and easy. With no rush. And now I'll, I'll adjust the heat a little bit more. And once these start to thicken up a little bit, then we'll add a little soft American cheese, just a little bit inside. But as Chef Henry said, there's no such thing as American cheese. He acts like I don't read his posts. <laughs> I read them all. So I'm gonna add a little bit of the soft cheese inside. All right, I'm gonna add a little bit of the cold butter. These are not your everyday grits before school. If your mama made you these like this before school, you're gonna fall asleep in class. <laughs> <laughs> so then I'll add a little salt, right? And then I'll see where we're at. So right now I'm gonna do like a little taste and kind of see where we're at. right there. This is that point that we talked about earlier. That it's right there. <laughs> so let's just pray. <laughs> <laughs> the last cheese will come up on this one. You see the velvetness of it and the creaminess of it. All right, so what I like to do with grits too is that once they're almost finished, I like to let them sit, right, and kind of come together before I put them in the, um, in the dish they're going to be served with, and I stick them in a the salamander to get a nice crust on them. It's a lot of cooks and a lot of chefs that don't taste their food oh, while they're terrible. cooking, you know what I mean? Like, how important is that? That's right there. There you go. He said it's right there. Oh, it's right there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's right, it's right there. It's right there. You know what I mean? Oh, most definitely is right there. Huh? Most definitely is right there. It's right there. You don't want to, you don't want to. So now, oh, yeah. it's right there. That's perfect. You know, so right now, we're going to go to the shrimp. This is a fast-moving dish. So I use a little vegetable oil to start. This is another fat-on-fat fat dish. <laughs> <laughs> right? And some heat on heat is I'll start with the andouille sausage. Some people, they'll start with the shrimp. I'll start with the sausage and kind of render it down and let some of that fat come out and leave it in the pan. I won't even take it out because the shrimp, they're cooking like three minutes, so the sausage aren't going to burn if you're paying attention. You can get as technical as you want to hear, <laughs> Chef. You can get as simple as you want here, yeah, Chef. Yeah, you know I don't want to. We, we want them to go to the glossary. You know yeah. what I'm saying? We want to force them into the glossary. <laughs> This ain't no cookie cutter, you know what I'm saying, yeah. show. We just not here standing in front of cameras in our house. No, you know, no, 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 no. Cooking from the, uh, from the professional cookbook, you know what I'm saying, the CIA uh -huh. textbook, you know what I'm saying? We're not doing that. We're really getting down. Yeah, that smells really good. Huh? That smells really so good. So right now, I'll take my jumbo shrimp. I do four per order. These are U8 to 12. All right. So I'll do a, um, a little kosher salt and a little black pepper. That's it, and I'll keep it really simple, all right? And for you all to know that you eight to 12 means that it's eight to 12 per pound, all right? We say the, the lower the number, the right. bigger the shrimp. The shrimp. bigger the shrimp, right? That means it's eight, between eight and 12 are gonna come per pound of shrimp that you purchase. So those are usually a little more, those are more expensive. Right. And I buy them peeled in the vein though. So, so now, what I'll do is I'll add 
the jalapenos, right? All right, these are just about ready. So I'll finish with like a little, a pinch of lemon juice, just to add a little acid to it. All right. Then I throw a little cold butter in. All right. One thing you don't want to do is someone's paying $28 for a dish, you don't want to overcook their shrimp. All right. So I'll just take this off here and I'll rest it. So now we'll plate up our, our grits. You see how they came together once you let them sit? They came together nice. They're still nice and smooth and, you know, the carryover cooking. All right. And then just a little cheese on top. All right. And then we'll pop it inside the scallop man. Yo, what's good, everybody? Chef Henry Dudley, host of the Chef Gang Podcast. And we are here live in Harlem, episode number six, Black Food Matters, part two. Um, I'm very happy where I'm at today. It's early in the morning. I'm back home in New York City, and I'm with a guy that um, I'm happy to not only call a colleague, a great chef, but also a friend. Yeah. Uh, chef Carlos Swepson is in the building. Yeah. I also have brought back my lovely co-host, Chef Kimberly Van Klein. She's going to be the Harlem historian today. Oh. You know what I'm saying? I'm a Bronx native, but she's the she's the she's the Harlem native. So I had to bring my my she wing. Tell about the rooftop. Day. Yeah, you know, yeah, rooftop. She's going to talk about all the crazy shit. You know what I'm saying? Oh, and uh, we was going to chop it up and like you know, feel free. You know what I mean? This is not, this is a safe space for everybody to talk how we talk. Um, this is a chef show for chefs by chefs so feel free to just say what you want to say how you feel no lactose no overdose no no cut we're no going cut. raw today yeah, so you know what i mean this ain't them other them other networks and them right, other shows right, we're right. really going to talk how we're supposed to talk today um i'm gonna say this i grew up in the bronx right and um you know so in the bronx i had pizza and you know italian ices and heroes from the bodega you know, and then we went out to eat, and we thought we was doing something high class. We was going to City Island and getting the seafood and so forth and so on. However, when my parents wanted to splurge a little bit, we came to Harlem. And when we came to Harlem, I remember like Jack's Nest, Amy Roof, mm -hmm. Sylvia's, with Londell's, Londell. you know, um, those were the, 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 the iconic restaurants that I remember. Lennox Lounge, you know, Cotton Club. I was too young to get in the Cotton Club, but I knew what that was about. The drop. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? And, and when, we, when we wanted to splurge a little bit and spend a little bit of paper, you know, we came to Harlem. Um, I'm happy to say that today I can actually sit across from a guy that I think is going to be um, in the talks of legendary Harlem chefs when we have those conversations down the line. Um, and I, I, I guarantee you're going to be in, in those conversations, brother. So we appreciate you having us here today. I appreciate being in your midst today, and I'm honored to be here. Me and Carlos go way back, okay? I met Carlos in the, the sacred halls of Virginia State University <laughs> way back in the day. Actually, I think if I'm not, if I'm not, um, uh, I think we met through Das Effects, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We was all hanging out with Das Effects. Well, 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 Dre from Das Effects and I grew up together. He's from Teaneck, I'm from Englewood, but he lived in Englewood when he was a child. Shout out to Das Effects, shout out to VSU, shout out to all the HBCUs. It was, it was, it was a troubling weekend for all yeah. of us, a troubling month because it's 2020, we can't go to homecoming. So we was all stressed out, but we here now. Um, but anyway, back to you, Chef. Talk to me about your journey like you know again like i said we met in, in school you know life happens we all separate we all lose contact sometime and then years later i popped up i'm in the game and i'm turning around and your chef carlos swepson like how was that journey like how did that happen like who we i think daryl reconnected us right yeah daryl yeah Darryl, yeah Darryl. big shout out to big d yeah big d so daryl reconnected us you know i always knew that i wanted to do something in the food industry and that i wanted to own a restaurant and, 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 and something of that nature, but I just had no idea when that, how that would happen. So I started cooking very young. Right. Younger than average. You know, I started cooking at home when I was like maybe five or six. And then back then my mother had this cookbook. I don't know if you remember, because she had just got married when mm -hmm. we moved up here. So she just got married in 1975. So she had these, these um, 
wedding gifts. So she had the cookbook, the, the Joy of Cooking. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right? So I would go through there. And then my mom bought me a wok. We were in the mall, and Sharper Image was there, and they had a wok. And I think I was like seven, eight then. And I was like, and she was like, well, what are you going to do with it? I said, I don't know. I don't know. I was buying oyster sauce and corn <laughs> sauce and, 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 and fish sauce, but I had no idea. Like, it was like, this looks good. I'm just yeah, going to throw this shit in there. Yeah, I didn't know. And then, then they had a fondue, so then I started playing with the fondue. And then I was like, at this point, I'm like 12, 13. So that started early. Mm-hmm. And then I went away to college. And then when I came back, I started waiting tables at a restaurant. Okay. Got it. I was actually New York restaurant school. Yeah. Going into it, because we were going to have this conversation. She was like, hey, I said, no, it was New York restaurant school first, and then, you know, it, it matriculated yeah, yeah. into that. So, yeah, so that's when, like, school started. And that's when it was just like, wow, this is this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, damn, this shit is good, chef. God damn. <laughs> I couldn't want to stop the show and just eat, but, you know, we've been professionals here. Um, so then fast forward, you know, um, your chef, Carlos Swepson, why Boulevard Bistro? Like, how did that happen? Like, what was the inspiration behind that? So, a buddy of mine had an opportunity, and he was opening a restaurant, and he asked me to come on. So I came on to do that, and they literally fired me the day before the grand opening. I was there for like four months, like getting the kitchen in order, training the staff, and I got fired the day before the grand opening. Marquisha at the time, who was my girlfriend at the time, she said, well, what are you gonna do now? And I was like, you know, so, so at that point, I'm like years into the industry, and I'm like, how can this happen? And in the way I got fired, it was just a, it was just a really bad space. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So she was like, you know, you should think about doing your own thing. I don't have any money for that or whatever, whatever, whatever. So I ran it by my mom, right? I was like, I ran it by her. Like, oh, I'm thinking about this, doing my own thing. So she was like, well, when we go on vacation this summer, I'll bring it up to your dad to see if he wants to invest, right? So she was kind of like the liaison to like... Good old moms, right? Yeah, to kind (laughs) of like... Mothers and their boys. Yeah, to sell it to her (laughs) husband that... You need to invest two hundred fifty thousand dollars into your son's business, and um, so that's what happened. So then she found Boulevard on one twenty second. Well, he actually found Boulevard, and then she's like, "I think I found your home." So boom, it just it just kind of like it took off from there. Like so, we purchased this turnkey restaurant. I just bought dishes and everything. I left the furniture there. So really, like. I took over a space that was already, I didn't change anything in the kitchen. Only thing I did was I, um, I changed the awnings outside and put my logo on the awnings, mm-hmm. and that was it. Got it. Um, clearly, you can cook your ass off. You know, I see celebrities in here all the time, and people always just raving about it. Um, and we talked earlier in the kitchen about just about food in general, how you see food. I said, let's hold off, because I just kind of want to get and dive into uh, Chef Carlos's culinary perspective, especially in terms of black food. You know what I'm saying? How you see food and how you think food should be treated, cooked, uh, respected, so forth and so on. I like things simple, right? I always almost say to people that like, like I like the Ralph Lauren version of food. Right. Right? Like I have a Ralph Lauren ver- uh, a blazer from a, a corduroy blazer from 95 that I still wear. Right. Shout out to all the low lowlifes, you know what I'm saying, yeah. out in Brooklyn. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Double yeah. L all yeah, day, yeah, right. you know. So, so, <laughs> so it's kind of almost like that. Like, right. it's just simple and classic. Right? Mm-hmm. Not to quote the New York Times what they said about me. Right. <laughs> but they said that <laughs> Chef Carlos simply makes good things taste better. Taste better. better. Right, right, right. I, I, I said you that know. we, we got to make sure we get that on the way out. We, <laughs> right. This show and this platform is strictly about you know, the conversation right. about black chefs right, right, right. and chefs of color because we don't get the platforms. And I'm not sitting here beefing about it or complaining about it. I just said that we got to pivot and we got to create our own platforms because right, right. other people ain't going to give it to us. No, you know what I'm saying? And they're not going to respect our stuff. They're going to actually take the stuff that we do and reinvent it with their resources and then and kind of shut us out. So that's what this platform 
platform is really all about. So, so how do you feel about the old school versus the new school in the coloring Well, it's almost like it's almost like with anything, right? It's almost like in music, right? Like in hip hop, when you look at like older artists compared to the newer artists, right? So you look at the I think this is the easiest way for people to kind of grasp it, right? So you look at the new artists that come out, right? And you look at ones that are successful, that they almost have a connection to someone from the older, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, you look at Drake, right? So this guy is kind of, you know, tied to Jay Prince and this. So he's tied to, like, someone that's been in the game 30 years, right? You look at J. Cole, right? He came through Jay, mm -hmm. you know? Jay came through Jazzo, came through Big Daddy Kane, who came through Cash, right? right. So, so this is the lineage of right. it, right? So it followed, right? So in, in, in food, if there's no lineage to it, right, then you're just doing what you think is best. And that's not right, right? Like, you work for John George. Like, we have a lineage where people could trace us back to where we came from. Most definitely. Right? In this industry, right? So these new guys, they come in, they don't have no lineage. If you can't trace it, back to something, then what are they, it's not their fault. Exactly. You know, because there's nothing that you're tracing it back to, right? It's tracing it back to them watching the Food Network and then making a mac and cheese for Christmas and their mom telling them, oh, it was great, you should be a chef. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I think there's a severe disconnect in terms of, uh, like she said, old school versus new school. Uh, but I look at it in two ways because I've talked to other chefs. You know, the last chef I interviewed, you know, he made a whole different uh, sense of it for me. And, uh, you know, some of them, they feel like we left them. They feel like yeah. that um, they, no, there's no connection there. They feel like, you know, you know, it's kind of like the crack era. You know what I'm saying? Our, our parents, friends, and so forth and so on, like, they left us. The men went to jail and so forth and so on, and we was out here doing whatever we had to do to make it happen, and then we had to disconnect with our kids and blah, blah, blah. So, and you can't tell these guys shit because they're on Instagram now, they're on social media now, and they're making money that they've never seen before. You know what I'm saying? So but it's hard to... A lot. But they think that it's a lot. It's not. Let's not get crazy. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, what the fuck's going on with the staff these days? Because when we came through, like, we came through wanting to do this shit. You know what I'm saying? I, again, I was kind of like you. Like, I kind of fell into it. But I always had to drive and I always had the connection with the food because I would go down to Mississippi and Louisiana, you know, to see my grandparents and she just would just be in the kitchen all day. Whereas my mom, you know, what I mean, when I got up here, she was a single mother. She was cooking for survival. Great cook, but it was on survival mode. You feel what I'm saying? I don't think these kids have the discipline that we used to have and really want to do it. It's just an easy job for them to get. How do you see it and how can we fix it and can we fix it? Oh, wow. Um, you know, there's, you know, as a chef, you're always looking for the solution. Right. Right? That's, that's what you do through the day, right? Everything's about a solution. Right? Everything is a solution. Shit goes wrong in the kitchen, <laughs> in the middle of the service. I, chef, we out of it. Well, well, how are we going to fix it? I don't give a fuck that we out of it. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. I need it. Right now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> What's the solution? Exactly. Right? So I, I think that you know, what I try to do is I try to just talk to them, right? I try to let them, I try to connect with them in a sense that I'm not different than you, right? And I try to connect with them on, like, is, first I ask them, is this what you want to do? Right? That's so you know where you stand. With that's the, well, number yeah. one I answer, is this what you want to do? Then they say, yeah, I say, well, do you love it? Then I would ask them, would you do it for free? Wow. Right? Deep. Bingo. You have to think about something, right? When we came up in this industry, you automatically respected the chef as soon as you walked through the door. Exactly. Yeah. He didn't have to earn your respect. Nope. You know, and I think that that's one of the things that I think is lacking today. It's definitely a disconnect in terms of the affirmations and how they feel about themselves. Um, the other thing I think is that we didn't have the shortcuts no. that they had. You know what I'm saying? We didn't have the ability to just throw chef in front of our name and no, get you on social media. You yeah, couldn't just yeah. you couldn't just walk around and say, oh, I'm a I chef. Was out of school, I want to say maybe four years before I felt comfortable calling myself a chef. Like <clears throat> you had to earn that. Like to earn people look at you like what? And now um 
I guess because of the way things are, and they just feel like they can do whatever they want to do. Like, they just throw it on their name and say, hey, boom. You know what I'm saying? And ride until the wheels falls off. And then when that's done, they go to the next hustle. You know, but then we get left with a diluted pool. And, and part of it is not their fault. Because you know what? This is our dream. This may not be their dream. Right, right. To open up a restaurant in New York City or Chicago or D.C. or one of the major cities, right? LA or, or Boston or, or, or the Bay Area, right? So this may not be their dream, right? I tell people all the time, I just, I don't like dumb shit. I just like you to be logical with stuff, right? Make it make sense. Make it make sense to mm -hmm. me. And don't be afraid to ask a No, I'm here at, uh, Sunday I'm here at 6.37 in the morning, right? If you told me at 8.30 we don't have collard greens, I'm like, why the fuck you ain't <laughs> told me at Right. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's not their passion. You know what I'm saying? You got to make it make sense. Then I'm mad at the person that's there. Then then I got enough heat for everybody. So the one that called last night, I said, why you didn't text me? Yo, chef, by the way, we're going to need collard greens in the morning. It should take three hours. Take three hours. Yeah. So. Yeah. Ne next thing I want to talk about is um, we all dealing with it. And um, I kind of want to talk and touch on the restaurant industry and where we at right now with COVID. Um, you know, you in the trenches, you know what I'm saying? And I salute you for being here and, you know, still staying open and doing what you gotta do to make it happen. And I know in the in in the radius of where you're at, like yeah, she's busting them down, right? Yeah, that's all right. She's <laughs> a good girl. Yeah, in the radius of where we at, um, you see I know you've seen a lot of restaurants fail, a lot of restaurants struggle. You see a lot of restaurants still making it happen. Um, what's your take and your outlook? You know, here in New York City, I got the DC perspective, but in New York City, um, how's COVID affected the industry um, as you see it? Well, that's a couple part question. Mm -hmm. So the first part of it is, is that, you know, as an owner, I almost feel like embarrassed being upset I'm losing money, mm -hmm. right? Because so many people have lost lives. Yes. Right? People have lost family members. One of my guys, he lost his, someone, what, what, my, one of my employees lost his dad, his mom. Another one of my employees lost his wife. Wow. My, my prep cook, he was on his deathbed. He was in the hospital for five weeks. I didn't even know where he was. So, yeah, so then when you look at, like, where we're at, right, so probably in the course of these last months, it's over a million dollars lost. Wow. Over a million. So the early part of COVID, I was coming in here by myself, right? I was, like, by myself cooking, doing the Uber Eats and Grubhub, right, because it wasn't, it was just takeout. Right. So I was doing everything myself, and I would call one of my dishwashers to come in, like, when I was almost finished the day. I had no money to pay anybody, so I only had, like, enough to pay him for, like, three hours, four hours a day. To come in and clean up. And, Just to come yeah. in and clean up after I made my mess. Right. Right? Sorry. So we were able to get the PPP loan through the first round, right? And, and that, was, that came because we don't deal with regular banks. I deal with a credit union. Mm -hmm. So that came kind of fast. But this is the back backlash of businesses and understanding that you have to have your business in order, right? So a lot of my employees, I was paying them as like 1099 employees, mm -hmm. right? So if anyone knows about the PPP loan, the PPP loan was just based on what you would, what your, your, your employee tax. Right. Do. So now that we open back up, everyone goes through payroll. Food for thought, you know, if you're out here and you, 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 you're a chef and you're aspiring to be in the restaurant business or whatever, especially if you're African-American or uh, people of color, you got to have your business together. That's the yeah, first thing you yeah, need to it. do. And because um, Raekwon from the block can't float your restaurant forever. Exactly. He going to want his money faster than the bank yeah, do. He, and yeah. that's going to cause a problem. Yeah, he's not going to do a 36-month long. Right, exactly. He's going to do about a 36-day long. Right, right, right. He want to see something. And he's going to be here every day. <laughs> Waiting for it. Eating for free. Eating for you free. know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Drinking for free. <laughs> <laughs> I've been reading, the reason why I started this uh, series for the podcast, Black Food Matters, is because I've been reading 
um, this book called Black Food Matters that these two uh, female professors uh, wrote. And it's just about, um, it's primarily about food insecurity. And when we talk about food insecurity, um, making sure that we can allocate food to certain demographics in certain places and so forth and so on, and um, the racial disparities in uh, how food gets to the hood as opposed to how it gets to, you know what I'm saying, the suburbs and blah, blah, blah. Um, and in terms of the COVID era that we're in, you know, I just walked down the street to the uh, the food bank and saw lines and lines of people and, the, and the struggle out here the struggle. is real. Now the struggle was already real before that, you know what I'm saying? I think it was like 35 million people in the country prior to COVID, you know, suffered from hunger and stuff like that. Um, my question is post COVID, um, do you think that us as chefs, especially black chefs in this industry, we have some sort of responsibility to continue to try to energize um, people getting food, the hunger that's going on. And if so, how can we? I mean, you know, we're trying to run businesses and so forth and so on. Like, what can we do? And I ask this question because it's not questions that's being asked. And um, I know we're all in our own vacuum trying to sustain our businesses and stuff like that. But we got people, mainly black people, out here fucking starving. Nah, that's a good question. No, I 100%, we, we, we're responsible, right? We're responsible for making sure that people eat. But, you know, when we're saying that we're responsible, doesn't mean that you're responsible to do what the food bank does. Right. But you have a responsibility to be involved. Right. Right? So it may be just donating food as we may donate to this church or to that church, right? Or like partnering up with World Central Kitchen like we were talking about. So, but 100%, it's an responsibility, right? Because really the reason you get into this industry really is to, is to feed, you're just here to feed people. I think there's, all, there's always, and this is, goes out to like the younger chefs, also, because I want them to understand, like, it's just not about cooking and making money. You have a moral obligation out here, especially yeah. as black chefs. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Other chefs, they, they do other stuff, and they do charity, and they do this, and they do that, and, you know, they write this off, they write that off. But we have a moral obligation as black chefs to, to feed our communities or to help feed or help inspire people to help feed our communities. I think that's something that we need to really um, push right. down. Right, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, I, I urge anybody out there who's struggling with hunger or anything like that just to kind of reach out to, you know, whatever resources you can find and take advantage of that as opposed to um, not saying anything. And I encourage any chef and any black chef especially to go out and try to go to D.C. Food Bank and go to New York Food Bank and see what's going on. It'll probably change your life because me just walking yeah. down the street just now waiting for you to come in, I was like, oh, shit. You're from Mississippi. Right. Um, I got family from Mississippi, you know, Louisiana. She got family from the South, you know, cuz over there, cameraman, videographer. He got family from the South. There, there was a, after, I guess, post-slavery, I want to call it, and Jim Crow, there was a huge migration of blacks to the door. Yeah, and, great and, migration. Right, and we, and, we, and we took our food with us. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We talked about earlier, you talked about classics and doing things the right way and not reinventing the wheel. Um, but there's also stigma around the food that we, that we cook, the fried chicken, the watermelon, oh, da, 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 da. I'm glad you said right. this. So how do we revolutionize our cuisine and do we revolutionize it? What do you think about that? The problem that I have is that, is that these kids that may go to culinary school or whatever, you know, when you start talking about culture, right? This is our culture, right? I don't give a fuck how much training you have. Fried chicken and collard greens is your culture. Mm -hmm. if you're black, right? Yeah. So the moment you don't want to cook your culture, right, someone else is going to cook it. Yeah. And then call it theirs. Right. Like they did jazz. Right. Right, because you didn't want to play it. I said, my grandmother grew up doing farm the table. But now y'all charge four dollars a person to eat from the table, right? This is our culture, right? 
streets. Y'all weren't farmers. Y'all were not farmers. No, you weren't. So stop it. <laughs> Y'all were not farmers. So we did farm the table to the highest level. Yes. Right? You got too many collars came in, what happened? You gave some to your neighbor because your crop came in heavy. Right, right. Sharecroppers. Sharecroppers. Right. <laughs> right? Because it came in heavy, you know? Your stream beans, your llama beans came in heavy, so you got what you call it. Your fruit came in, so you made some preserves. So mm -hmm. they could splash you through the winter. Your figs came in, your peaches came in. Think about it. Why is it okay for them to make us feel insecure about our food? No, 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 no. Thing, yeah. and, you know, fried chicken and watermelon. Why we get that stigma? But the funny part is that when I became a private chef, true story, private chef in the Hamptons, cooking for everybody. Top names, I ain't gonna put no names out there, but you know, and they were white. The first thing, you know, I'm thinking I'm talking from culinary school, so I can cook guagua wah and this, that, and the third. And no, they don't want that. that. They didn't want that. I just, they wanted fried chicken, <laughs> mac and cheese, collard greens, like for, for I was like, mm -hmm. oh. Oh, that's what they really? wanted. And they wanted it. And I they said, wanted that's it. What? That's what they wanted. You, 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 you going to pay very well for it. Yeah. I, I, I think that it's okay for us to, and if if you are classically trained or if you're not and you're serious about this business and you're, and you're, and you're black, I think it's okay to experiment with other cuisines because it helps you learn technique. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? But at the same time, um, I think it's very disparaging to see black chefs that say, you know, I don't want to cook this. I don't want to cook yeah, that. They ought to be you ashamed know? of themselves. Yeah, like, I, and, and, not proud of your culture. Nah. You know what I'm saying? Because Italians will go and they'll cook Italian and they'll go and they'll and they'll drop it down like, no, this is northern Italian. This is coastal Italian. Right. This is this is South Italian. You know what I'm saying? They'll be proud of that. But with us, we'll be like, oh, well, I don't want to do that. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm embarrassed. I don't want to cook this fried chicken. And so from, so I opened up a restaurant down where we went to college at in the farmer's market building. I had a restaurant in there and line would be around the corner. White folks wanted fried chicken, mac and cheese. Yeah, you, you know what I'm saying? Because when you interviewed Chef Brock, he won Hell's Kitchen, first black guy to win yep. Hell's Kitchen. He cooked fried and chicken you know what I cook? and shrimp and grits. Fried chicken and, and shrimp and grits. On his finale. And that's how I won. Because he cooked from his heart. Yeah, I couldn't do that at the James Beard house. I'm sure. This dish right here. Yeah. I'm That's sure. Facts. Oh, I believe you. No, no, this is a fact. Right. And the thing is, is I like. I did a dinner at the James Beard house. I cooked this with my biscuits. Wow. And, and, they, and they loved it. it. They devoured it. There was another that top shit. chef that's won four James Beard with me. And they said, and, 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 and the director of the James Beard house, when they were talking about everything, they said, Chef Carlos has already proved to us that he could cook circles around everyone in the room. Mm hmm. Because these biscuits are like pillows. Lovely. <laughs> and the person standing next to me won four James Beards. Mm -hmm. and, and listen, you don't have to cook it, but you have to respect it. And appreciate it. You have right. to appreciate it. And you can't, you can't go around thinking that you're better than this. And that's what people, they like to do sometimes. They like to say, well, I'm better than this. You're not better than this. Right. right. Harlem. I want to talk about Harlem for a minute. And I want to touch on it because I think it's something that needs to be touched on. And you've probably seen it and dealt with it. And I want to see how you feel about it and what you've seen and, you know, get your take on. Um, gentrification. Um, I used to run, uh, I ain't going to say the name of the yeah. restaurant, but I used to run a restaurant down near by 12th Avenue, mm -hmm. um, underneath the bridge, uh, barbecue spot. Mm -hmm. And we had to wind up moving that spot across the street mm -hmm. um, because um, a Columbia. very, yeah, yeah, Columbia came in and bought up everything. Um, next thing you know, you know what I'm saying? And again, I'm all about making sure that uh, neighborhoods grow and become more, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I'm okay with it becoming more eclectic or whatever, whatever, but what I hate is for people to run a situation down and then put resources behind it and call it their own. Um, good or bad, what's your take on gentrification and how have you seen it in Harlem and, and, and so forth and so on? <laughs> Before I opened up in Harlem, right, like I really didn't understand gentrification. But gentrification is, is part of the reason why I'm here, to be able to do things the way I do it. Okay. Right? 
So I have to I have to understand that first. Gentrification is not a bad thing. The bad problem happens is when you go into a neighborhood and you try to make it yours. It's not yours. Understood. Yep. You're just borrowing it. Even as a black person that came from the South that grew up in Jersey, this is not my neighborhood. I'm borrowing it from Harlem. They're so gracious to let me in. Right? So I can't Absolutely. act like this is mine. This is not mine. There was people here before I got here. When I leave, there's going to be people here, right? So that's the only problem I have. So maybe you can speak to this maybe you can. Um, how do you feel about black chefs representation, you know, on cable channels in the media as we speak today, as we see it? We don't have a rep- So to answer your question, there is no representation for us. That's number one. Number two... The people that are in place, the program directors, aren't of us. So I think that that because we're not represented in the boardrooms and in the decision making of these networks, that there's no one holding their feet to the fire that this is what needs to go, right? First of all, I think that someone needs to just do a history of food in America. Right. <laughs> and that will open up a whole... Man, you need to just do that whole... Just do that. And, 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 and starting with Jefferson's Black Chef, right? Starting there, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Or you can even start a little before there, right? You can start with why we use sweet potatoes because we brought them with us and all this stuff is right. on the slave ships, right? So you can even start wherever you want to start, but start somewhere around the 1700s. Because they don't know about the Chef Hercules. They don't know about the Rufus Estes. And they don't know about those guys because they're not taught that. They're not taught that. So you got to start there. Again, like I said, last serious question. Um, Whether it's white chefs, white cooks, white industry, black industry, or whatever, there's a significant amount of brokenness in in, in, in culinary and restaurant culture. Um, And I'm trying to... I see a lot of it that I used to see when I was a corporate chef and all that other stuff, you know what I mean? Um, the mental illness, the, 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 the addiction, the alcoholism, um, the, you know, the philandering, the, you know, all the stuff that comes with it. Um, as black people in the industry, how do we, in black you know, executives, chefs, and, 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 and restaurant managers and stuff, how do we combat that and help you know, the people in our industry, because I feel like, true story, it's just kind of a loaded question because I came from that, I experienced that. I experienced the alcoholism, the substance abuse, all that crazy shit that came me with- too, me too. Yeah, with all that crazy shit that came with- um, Womanizing. Yeah, all, all of that oh, yeah. crazy shit that came with um, being a chef in the industry. And um, it cost me a lot, you know what I mean? It cost me a lot. It cost me a lot. And yeah. I was able to, you know, dust myself off and move forward, but I see it present in a lot of the sous chefs I train, a lot of the cooks that I deal with that are all in, we're all in black spaces, you feel what I'm saying? And um, I know that we recruit, I'm not gonna say recruit, I know it takes a special kind of fucking person to do what we do every day. You gotta be able to deal with a lot of stress and and, and deal with a lot of, uh, you know, extreme conditions and so forth and so on. And a lot of times we deal with that in a negative way. Um, is there any hope for us to be able to change that, 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 you know, that thing that we have, not only just, just black chefs, but white chefs and chefs in, in, rec- in, in, in the restaurant industry people as a whole, there's a severe brokenness in it. And it's even more prevalent now with COVID. You know what I'm saying? I opened up the restaurant in Virginia. I swear 80% of the people that I had on staff you know, had opioid addictions or, you know, had alcoholism addictions. Like, can you speak to that? The restaurant industry is an industry of misfits. Right. We're all the misfits. pirates of peasants. We're, <laughs> we're all misfits. This is why we connect the way we connect. Because we can't fit in anywhere else. Right. This is where we fit in, right? So you have an industry that's built on misfits. Right? That's deep. That they can't fit anywhere else in life. Right? So this is where they fit. 
whether it be me, I'm, I'm 24 years sober, so whether it be a, a drug and alcohol addiction, whether it's a molestation from a child, mm-hmm. whether it's an abuse from a parent, rather it's not being told you were good enough, we are not being hugged, there's something broken, right? So you get into this industry where everyone's like you. Everyone's right. like you, yeah. So you can still be broken. Right. Mm-hmm. You can still be in a womanizer. You can still adult. You can still cheat on your wife. You can still do all of these things because everyone is doing it. Right. right. And, and, and this, you feel accepted. accepted. You feel accepted, right? So you're in this where there's no shame. There's no guilt around what's your, your brokenness, right? Oh, yeah, it's like, you should but show also, last night. Right. Up. Yeah. 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 right, but there's also no accountability. That's what I'm saying. There's no accountability. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, yo, man, just have fun with this question. Why does black food matter? Well, black food matters because it's, it gives us, it's a nostalgic food, right? It, and everyone loves it. Mm-hmm. Everyone. It's delicious. It's delicious. It <laughs> tastes good. It smells good. You can smell the seasoning. You can smell the flavors. You know, people love that, man. Just like they love black black music, black fashion. Black everything. Black food has a story to tell. Yeah, it has a story. Yeah, it has a story. No one talks about this. And I want to be the one to talk about it. Is that the reason, one of the reasons that we don't take responsibility for our food is that we were pushed away from it. We ran we ran from farming, right? We were, the, we were the cooks were not glorified. We were the right. cooks at all levels, from, from Big Mammy to the guy cooking at the Waldorf, right? These weren't white chefs. These were black guys, right? So it, it, it was not a glorious job. Not you know? None whatsoever, right. So we ran from it. So when you're a child in the 70s and you have a love for cooking I mean I was fortunate enough to have parents that understood it mm-hmm. but they didn't understand it to this level right right right. where kids now their parents may understand it to this level they just don't know how to get them to this level mm-hmm. you know I came from where, where both parents were college degrees so they were like ah you want to work in a restaurant ah I, I, mean, <laughs> I asked my dad one day, I said, I said, even after you loaned me the money for the first restaurant, did you think it would turn to this, to your son being on all the networks and your son being in the New York Times and Washington Post and all these major newspapers? He said, no. And I asked him the second question. I said, if I was seven and I was right-handed and I was able to dribble a ball with my left hand, would you think I was special? He said, yes. I said, well, what's the difference with a seven-year-old cooking out of a wok? That's and me. there you have it. <laughs> Last chef question. What's in Chef Carlos's market basket? I'm coming here. I'm doing a stage for you. What do you put in that market basket? Um, I put some type of protein, right? I put eggs, right? Because I need you to make me an omelet. I'm an omelet. <laughs> I, I eat omelets all day. Like, you know what I mean? Um, some some easy vegetable, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and some, some fruits. Oh, Chef, man, um, I appreciate you, brother. Thank you, thank you. You know what I'm saying? Cool. Um, I just got to say this. Like, um, I love this. I love this space that we're in. I love that we came full circle. Yeah, we can sit down and have this conversation. You know what I'm saying? Like I said, we go way back. Um, we don't all had our trials and tribulations. Yeah, yeah. Um, I respect the love that you have for food. I respect your transparency. Yeah. And I definitely look forward to, you know, hearing your name in the history books. Uh, you know what I'm saying? In terms of... That's not my doing. I can't do that. Right. But it's, it's coming. It's, it's coming. coming. You I do, just got to keep doing what I do. Keep doing that's what you're it. doing. And, and God takes come. care of the rest. You know what I'm saying? So... Um, God takes care of the rest. That's it, man. Chef Game Podcast. We out. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate you, bro. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ken. We out. Can we get a quick shot of Rebel? Yes, we gotta give, we gotta, we gotta get you on here. Aww. Hey, Rebby. <laughs> hey, Rebby. She is too cute. Hey, baby. This is what you do it for, right? That's it, that's it. Give daddy kisses. <laughs> <laughs>